Mars. And if we think about, well, I, I, if you catch news articles coming out, it seems like we're discovering water on Mars all the time. Um, starting about 20 years ago, we discovered that one of the moons of Jupiter had a global subsurface ocean. And I'll talk about that. But uh, a moon about the size of our moon named Europa literally has a saltwater ocean covering the entire body. Um, now we know that there is water throughout the solar system. There are these ocean worlds that are covered in water. Uh, and we're learning things like even Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, which is kind of this hellscape, um, might still have water ice at its poles in, in regions that are permanently shadowed and have never seen sunlight. Um, but all these blue arrows here are pointing to planets where we know there are moons or think there are moons with global subsurface liquid water oceans. So if we think about following the water, this used to be a slogan for uh, observing Mars. This is Earth, and this little blue sphere here is taking all of the water uh, that we have on Earth and putting it into a little ball orbiting us. And if we do the same thing for Mars, you notice that there's you know, not a whole lot of water hanging out on Mars. If we look at Jupiter's moon Europa, uh, you can see that <laughs> this tiny little moon has twice as much water is the entire Earth. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot about Europa today because it's kind of um, my uh, passion. But if you go to europa.nasa.gov, you can see all of the amazing work we're uh, doing to explore Europa and bodies like it. Um, and so again, I want to emphasize that we're talking about you know, saltwater oceans like on Earth that can be, you know, tens of miles or hundreds of miles deep on these bodies that are covered from space by tens of miles of ice. Um, and so these are really impressive worlds. Uh, while I normally try and say things in miles for the American public audience, I know there's a non-zero number of Norwegians on the line. Um, so the oceans can be hundreds of kilometers covered by ice tens of kilometers thick. There are uh, several worlds that we're pretty sure are ocean worlds. We've never been inside of one of these oceans, and so it can be pretty difficult to know that they exist. In our little railway map here, uh, we have the Earth, the biggest body at the center, and then these are ordered by the amount of water they have. And so again, the black circle here is going to show the size of the body, and the blue circle is going to show the amount of water if you put it all in a sphere. And so, there are really little worlds like Saturn's moon Enceladus that you can fit inside of California. Um, there are asteroids. There are uh, ocean worlds that are bigger than the planet Mercury. So um, the most water in the solar system is on uh, Jupiter's moon Ganymede. Um, it's the amount of water on Ganymede is larger than the moon if put into a single volume. Its ocean is probably several hundred kilometers deep. And so these are really, really fascinating bodies. And because they have these uh, ancient global oceans, some of these oceans are billions of years old, they've become a really high priority target in the search for life. So another important part about this is like Earth, many of these worlds are geologically active. This is showing an example cutaway of Europa, where we have an ice shell that's between a few and many tens of kilometers thick. This is water ice covering liquid salt water. Um, and then we have a rocky interior, just like Earth's rock. But the surface of the ice is actually very, very young. So Earth's surface is constantly erased by processes like erosion and plate tectonics. And the average uh, age of exposed surface on Earth is about maybe 100 million years. For somebody like me, that's a relatively short amount of time. Um, it's about half that on Europa. And so these are really active bodies, which means they're moving a lot of the chemistry inside the body around. Um, and like on Earth, you want to create as many different chemical contacts as possible uh, to result in habitable environments. Um, you want to keep, uh, so processes that can connect different environments, like the surface environment in ocean or the rocky environment in ocean are places where uh, it's critical to go and search for life. Um, my own research focuses a lot on what the interior of these ice shells are like and where habitable environments might be. This is an artist's uh, cutaway of an ice shell showing um, that you can have deep ice that flows almost like a fluid at the bottom of an ice shell that's maybe 20 kilometers thick. You can have lakes posed within it. You can have different uh, cracking and fracturing processes that move material around. 
And all of these can relate to habitability. Um, just to throw the kind of work I do in there, uh, I like to build um, computer models of planetary ice shells and pull on them and push on them to see what happens. So here are a little bit uh, more complex cutaways of looking at two ocean worlds. On the left is Enceladus, which is really, really small. It's the one that could fit in California. And then the right is Europa, that's about the size of Earth's moon. And there's a lot going on here, but the important things I wanted to point out is that a lot of these ocean worlds have some similar features. Deep oceans, their oceans are hundreds of kilometers deep. Thick ice shells that can be a few to tens of kilometers thick. Um, lots of geologic activity that can move material around. And also activity at the seafloors. Uh, I'll show a slide later about why seafloor activity is important, but this has big implications for where life can be in the solar system. Now, we've explored these before. We, we know that there are oceans because we've been to them. Surprisingly, we haven't been too many times. Um, in the 1970s, we did our first flyby of Jupiter with the Voyager probes, where we saw the surfaces of these by the first time. We saw that they were likely made of ice and that they were young. We had no idea there was an ocean. It wasn't until the Galileo mission in the 90s uh, where <clears throat> we really spent some time flying by these bodies um, and we found that they affected the magnetic field of Jupiter in a way that can only be explained if they have a global saltwater ocean. And so that was really a key tipping point. There were these measurements that indicated there could be oceans on Europa, and all of a sudden it was kind of the race was on to see where else there was oceans. Um, the Cassini mission to Saturn in the early to mid 2000s went to Enceladus, and I'll show some some uh, renders of Enceladus later. It's a tiny body, but it has slow gravity that its ocean is literally leaking out through the ice to space, making these fantastic geysers at the South Pole that we flew the Cassini spacecraft through. Um, we've discovered potential past events at the asteroid Ceres, and even Pluto might have been an ocean world. Real quick, I wanted to show a clip from uh, the Cassini flybys. This is a computer rendering based on some of the data of the spacecraft. But there are these large South Pole jets where ocean material is leaking into space. Towards the end of the Cassini mission, when it became um, uh, easier to do some of the more exotic maneuvers after we collected all the science from Saturn and the system we needed, we were able to do things like fly through the prunes. And we sampled really important material in there that indicated the oceans are probably actually, um, well, they're potentially habitable for life. And so there are also a lot of planned ocean worlds missions. Uh, the European Space Agency is going to be sending a flagship mission to Jupiter, where they are going to um, fly by all of the different moons of Jupiter, three of which are ocean worlds, and try and figure out their relative habitability compared to each other. There's the Europa Clipper mission. It's a flagship mission by NASA. This is the one I work on that will assess the habitability of Europa. And really, it orbit Jupiter flying by Europa. Uh, because there's really harsh radiation, so we're just dipping our toe in it and flying out a bunch of times to really explore the habitability of that one body. And um, you might have seen in the news, recently NASA has decided that we're going to send an octocopter to Saturn's moon Titan. Titan is really cool because it's an ocean world. It has an ice crust with a deep ocean, but its surface has clouds and rain and lakes, um, none of which are water. Uh, it actually has methane rain and methane clouds and methane lakes. Um, and so it's a surface that looks very much like Earth on top of this water ice shell, but it's very exotic. And so in the 2030s, we'll be exploring the surface of Titan with an octocopter. I'll let the animation finish a little. I, I think it's really neat. Um, you see animations in the news uh, related to like the Mars rovers and how they land on the surface. And I find it very interesting that with Dragonfly, you can just let it fly away from the parachute and off it goes. And so, of course, there are also many proposed ocean worlds concepts. Um, the discovery of these bodies, again, is really relatively recent. And so there's no end to the kind of science that we want to do in them. There are proposals to go land on them. There's proposals to fly through sand, or fly through some of these jets, like we saw at Enceladus, and even bring material back to Earth to study, to float around the atmosphere of Titan with solar power, or to even go into the very outer solar system to the ice giant Neptune, 
where this cantaloupe looking moon called Triton is hanging out and a lot of people think might be a giant ocean world. But the ultimate goal really, uh, at least in my mind, has become to reach the ocean. When we explored Mars, we flew by it, then we orbited it, we landed, and then we roved around and soon we'll be flying a helicopter on it. The reason that we move around in a rover on Mars is because the most interesting sites are distributed on the surface. Um, in an ocean world, we think the most interesting sites where you might have potentially habitable environments are actually deep inside the ice shell and in the ocean. So our real goal rather than, um, at least in my opinion, uh, a, a major goal rather than spending a lot of time moving around the surface is figuring out how to get inside uh, and do some good science. And so I'm going to show a kind of complicated chart just for a moment because but while it's complicated, I think it really captures where we are. This is something called a ladder for life detection, and it's a new concept we're using to think about how and where we search for life in the solar system. And so over here, we have just a couple example of these bodies. We have Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, and the green one is Titan, the one that we'll send an octocopter to. In the middle of them is Europa, and at the bottom is the asteroid series. And so you can see that to advance the search for life, you have to identify that an ocean is there, you have to characterize it, you have to assess the habitability of that ocean, and then it makes sense to search for life. And there are lots of steps involved. You have to understand the kind of energy and chemistry that's there, what physical conditions are, and what the biomarkers are that you might actually look for. Um, and so dark blue here shows where we have a solid foundation, the hash stuff is where we're still trying to figure it out, and this orange bar is where Europa Clipper is going to take us. So I think a lot about Europa, and after the Europa Clipper mission, I think we're going to be ready to start looking for biosignatures. So thinking to Europa, um, Europa has more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. Uh, it has the essential elements required for life. Um, it has chemical energy, both from above on the irradiated surface and below. And it's had a lot of stability. It's four billion years old. And so, one thing that's really beautiful about these places is that um, where you have water in contact with rock on earth you can develop things like i'm showing on the right here hopefully the video isn't too choppy for you but this is showing a uh, hydrogen sulfide chimney something called a hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the earth's ocean and this is where water gets deep into the rock where it's really hot and dissolves a lot of minerals and it jets out and builds these big mineral towers Interestingly, we found that these are some of the most likely environments for where life might have started on Earth. And so um, actually around the same time we were starting to understand the importance for these seafloor environments in the origin of life on Earth, we started to understand that there were oceans beyond Earth. And so one of the big questions is, are the seafloors of these ocean worlds like the seafloor of Earth? And if so, is that a place that life could potentially emerge? If we look at the surface of Europa, though, it looks nothing like Earth. I mentioned that it, there's a lot of geology going on, just like there is here. You know, when you look at the moon, you see a lot of craters, unlike Earth, because the moon has no atmosphere for erosion. It has no plate tectonics to constantly erase the surface or to build new mountains. Um, Europa does have processes like those, but they're just very alien. You get these kind of ridgy yarn ball uh, textures. You know, this is about 100 miles across in this image. You get what we call chaos terrains because it looks a little bit like somebody took their fist and punched a hole in the surface. There are very few craters on Europa. Um, and there's lots of there, there's lots of exotic geology, things we like to call lenticulae. I like showing this because these little pits and domes are named after freckles in Latin. When we think about landing and exploring these worlds, it can get pretty complex. You can see a 500 meter scale bar down here. And so you can see that there's a lot of activity going on in the surface, there's a lot of activity going on in the ice, and there's a lot of activity going on in the ocean. And so it's actually pretty difficult to think about how someday we're going to explore these environments. There might be plumes at Europa. Uh, these would be a little bit unlike the plumes of Enceladus, which are really bright and beautiful. We can kind of sort of see them in like this Hubble image if you squint your eye and look at the bright pixel. So there are lots of amazing questions to answer. Um, sending Europa Clipper this decade. It'll get there around the end of the 2020s, beginning of the 2030s. And we're going to do all sorts of stuff. We're going to look at the internal structure of Europa by measuring gravity. Um, 
we're going to measure the magnetic field, which tells us about the ocean. Of course, we'll do imaging of the surface uh, and not just visible imaging, but we'll look over a bunch of different wavelengths of light that can tell you about where activity is. We're bringing in ice penetrating radar. So the same way that you can use a Doppler radar for weather forecasting to bounce off a cloud and know where that cloud is, we'll be sending radar waves into the ice to bounce off things like um, internal structures, potential lakes, or even the bottom of the ice shell. Uh, we're going to be collecting any dust that we fly through to see what it's made of as well and start to tell us about the surface composition. So when we go there later this decade, we're really going to be doing a deep dive into Europa to understand the entire body as a system because of its importance in understanding habitability as we engage in this search for life. I am um, including here an animation just that I find really neat of a, an example Europa flyby. Again, the spacecraft is going to orbit Jupiter because the radiation environment of Jupiter is really bad when you get close, as close as Europa is. And so you just dip in. But one thing I find impressive is right now the altitude's about 100,000 kilometers off the surface. And what you're seeing is different instruments turn on. Some of them scan space to kind of calibrate while some are starting to look at the surface. The spacecraft travels about four kilometers per second relative to Europa. And one of the things I'm constantly amazed of at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is their ability to navigate things. And so I think it's fun to watch, starting from uh, millions of kilometers, the fact that eventually we pass it at 25 kilometers off the surface. It really feels like threading an interplanetary needle from, uh, from Earth. And so we'll be doing these flybys uh, over and over until we build up a web of our understanding of the body. And so this feeds into a broader vision of how one might explore Europa's ocean. Um, while Europa Clipper is a planned mission that would fly by Europa to better understand its surface, there are also lots of proposed and potential future missions that how we take the next steps in towards of getting into the ocean. And so after we were to do a first sort of flyby mission, the next step would be to land on the surface. There is a, what we call a pre-project, um, for a Europa lander. That is a mission that NASA hasn't quite decided to send yet, but that we're really trying to uh, understand all the complexities of. Um, uh, something I spend a lot of my time on is thinking about subsurface access. And so I work on several of these different concepts that look into how you can through this ice shell of Europa to get into the interior ocean. We're kind of lucky that the ice shell is made of ice <laughs> rather than rock um, because it melts. And so uh, one thing that NASA is investing in in terms of understanding the technologies for right now and work that's going on at JPL is figuring out how we can, uh, rather than send rovers to somewhere like Europa, send deep ice penetrating cryobots. Um, now, it would take several years to get through an ice shell like this. Uh, but once you do, you know, there's really wonderful science you can do. Um, we're exploring different technologies, for example, that could deploy underwater buoyant rovers and look around at the ice ocean interface for any potential signs of life or habitability. Uh, I mean, I just find this a really fascinating problem to be working on. Um, a, a scientist working at NASA headquarters said it really well once in a way that I liked that when you're sitting on an airplane, you really don't have to tell anybody why you want to go into the ocean of Europa. Uh, pretty much the moment you tell somebody that there is a giant ocean the size of the moon orbiting Jupiter, their first question is, cool, what's in it? Um, and so that plays a little bit to uh, how we participate more in the US and in the international community with in terms of getting these technologies ready through required testing in relevant environments. You know, Europa, the surface is cold. It, its surface is only 100 Kelvin, 100 degrees above absolute zero. It uh, only has about the gravity of our moon. So it's a very different environment to Earth. But it turns out once you're really deep in that ice shell, the pressures and temperatures are very similar to glaciers on Earth. And so there's a lot of questions we can do by exploring there. One of the biggest steps here is taking these planetary technologies to the field. Um, so we think about deploying in relevant environments on Earth, like the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, and that requires large inter or interdisciplinary teams of scientists, engineers, 
Um, and it's kind of interesting because while mostly we think about how we adapt things we figured out how to do on Earth to the planets, uh, this sort of planetary oceanography is an interesting part. Some of the robot or robotics that we're developing for planets can actually help us explore the Earth. Um, one really cool uh, vehicle that has been worked on at JPL is something called Bruy, uh, the buoyant rover for under ice exploration. It's a version of that um, vehicle you saw deployed under the ice in the animation at the end of the uh, video I just showed. And so this is a vehicle that um, has been deployed by a researcher named Kevin Hand at JPL, as well as Tom Nordheim, who helps uh, put together this series. And it's a planetary technology that's really being used to start to under or explore under ice environments on Earth. And so they've had some very successful uh, deployments of the vehicle. Um, I really love these videos because I just think about how cool it's going to be someday if we do this somewhere like Europa. Um, and, you know, it, it's not just a demonstration of some cool technology you might see in 30 years, but it also is capable of doing a real world science um, right now. So the ocean worlds are this really cool intersection of work on the planets and work on Earth because we live uh, on an ocean world. Turns out Earth actually has the first discovered ocean of any planet. Um, and uh, there are a lot of ways we can take advantage of that. You know, thinking about, for example, um, the given that this is the Norway California Business Association hosted talk, there are a lot of ways um, that Norway is and can be involved in this kind of thing. Uh, Canute Oxnavard has done a great job in helping us understand the different field sites available. For example, when we think about um, new technologies we wanna deploy, we might only want 100 meters or so of ice. And so there are certainly opportunities in places like Svalbard to access these uh, glaciers where there's still a lot of infrastructure people can go or can use. Um, but there's also deep field sites, thinking about like the Fimble Ice Shelf in Antarctica, places where you could go through ice and then actually enter the ocean below. And again, when you're at these places, kind of the nice thing is that um, you're not just doing uh, a demonstration of a technology, you can do real science along the way. And so there's always this great ability to integrate Earth scientists with a planetary role as you go forward. Um, and of course, uh, thinking about Norway, there's a lot of oceanographic expertise. Uh, this is a picture of me as a grad student in the Norway basin. Uh, I sailed out of Bergen on a research cruise and pulled some old rocks up off the seafloor uh, and actually managed to find one biosignature. Um, so I, I think it's a really engaging problem uh, that we know there are these oceans out there orbiting Jupiter and Saturn and in the asteroid belt and potentially Pluto and beyond. We, we're just starting to understand that they're actually relatively common in the solar system. Um, and so for me, the biggest driver behind my science is thinking about the fact we know there are these oceans in the solar system and I feel this almost obligation to go explore them uh, because we're at this intersection where we now have the scientific understanding and we're starting to develop the technologies that could start to make these things a reality within our lifetime. So, that was a, an overview of all the things I'm excited about. Um, I'm pretty lucky in that I love talking about my day job. And so with that, if there are any questions or uh, you know, if, if folks want to have a conversation about um, this work or interesting aspects, uh, I'm happy to do that. So thanks again for inviting me, Knut. Okay, let's see. Okay, hey. Um, so thank you so much for a great talk. Um, we have quite a few questions here on the chat. Um, we can go through them systematically here. Maybe we should do that. Sure. Let's see, they're adding up more. So um, do you want to read them or should I read them for you? Um, I can read them. You can. So, we can start with uh, Bill Long. Yeah. Bill asks, uh, based on what we know at present, which ocean world outside Earth is the most likely to offer life? Um, so, <laughs> I, I think it's a great question. Uh, and I am going to give you 
my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of my community, NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or anybody else. I happen to like Europa over here on the right for a couple reasons. Um, hopefully, my uh, people only see my paused app. Oh no, <laughs> my sharing broke. Give oh. me one second. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, I happen to think that Europa is probably a more habitable body for a couple reasons. Jupiter has a moon called Io. You can see it kind of in this image in the very back. It's very small. Io is essentially one giant volcano. It orbits very close to Jupiter. And like you think about tidal waves on Earth caused by the moon going around the Earth, uh, Jupiter is a little bit bigger than the moon. So on Io, that tide is within the entire solid rocky part of the planet. Um, moving all that rock around creates a lot of friction. And so there is a lot of volcanism on Io that's constantly shooting out into space. Uh, one of the, uh, if you ever go and visit a volcano on Earth, you'll notice they smell like eggs because they spew a lot of sulfur. So one interesting thing that happens is Io spews a lot of sulfur and it ends up on the surface of Europa. And as I mentioned, the radiation at Europa is pretty bad, but something really cool happens. If you take the sulfur from Io and you stick it on a piece of ice and then you irradiate it with Jupiter, um, you end up with something called an oxidant. So uh, this is something that um, wants to find an electron. Well, on the seafloor, I mentioned there are these uh, potential for hydrothermal vents or the other kinds of activity we see on Earth's seafloor. Turns out the reactions between salt water and rock are reducing, meaning they add a lot of electrons into an environment. And it's a very geologically active world. So one cool thing is if you can take some of the oxidants from the surface and bring them down to the reductants at the bottom, you can uh, set up basically one material that has electrons and one that wants them. And the cool thing is that reduction oxidation potential, which is a bit of a mouthful, is what every known metabolism uses to operate. Regardless of what they eat or what reactions they use, that metabolism is uh, reduction oxidation potentials power all life. Um, and so the ice ocean interface of Europa would be my bet. Uh, Enceladus is great, but it's very tiny and its ocean might be young. And there's not the same kind of story about um, irradiated oxidants on the surface. So it's a personal preference, um, but I like Europa. So reading James Lively's questions, can organisms that have been shown to be able to survive on the outside of spacecraft survive on some of these bodies? Oh, yes. So this strongly ties into a field of research called planetary protection. Uh, we think about planetary protection a lot. So one thing we absolutely don't want to do is uh, sneeze on the rover, send the rover to Europa, and you know have germs now thrive all over the body. And the reason isn't what you might think. It's not because we don't want to overwhelm or destroy any life that might already be on Europa. It's because someday we're going to go try and detect life there. And we have to be really, really sure that it's not life we had previously brought. So lots of... Um, effort goes into making sure that's true. Spacecraft are built in very sterile environments. Uh, the different components are heated up and baked to, to kill the things on them. Um, there's Planetary protection is a really large part integrated deep into our work. Uh, if you paid attention during the Cassini grand finale a couple years ago, um, we crashed Cassini into Saturn and we did the same thing with Galileo at Jupiter. And the reason that we do that is actually primarily to avoid them accidentally crashing in the future somewhere like Europa or Enceladus that could potentially harbor life. Uh, and so yes, it, it's a very big consideration. Um, reading Brandon's question, uh, would surface Europa missions be a gradual process of drilling a hole through the use of robotics or will we be able to get boots on the ground and immediately be able to enter the ocean? It's a really good question. Um, and it's one we grapple with a lot. So. Right now, there's a lot of work going on in this technology development effort for a Europa lander. And um, most of that centers around the fact that we have never seen the surface of Europa. Uh, I mean, I've showed you images of the surface of Europa, but let me bring up those images real quick. The best picture we've ever taken of the surface 
is 16 meters, so about 50 feet per pixel. Uh, and the lander's a lot smaller than 50 feet, so we have no idea on the scale of a lander um, what the surface actually looks like. And knowing that these images are about, I think, five miles across each, one question would be, where would you want to land on this, right? It's, it's really, really difficult. So a lot of the current effort is going into how do we land on a surface that we've never seen before? Um, and I think actually it's really important that uh, there would be at least two missions in, in getting um, into a subsurface ocean. I think it's really important that we go to a body like Europa or Enceladus and we prove to ourselves we really know how to land there first before we bring all of the um, time and energy and equipment it takes to make a subsurface probe. So uh, I personally would want to land on Europa at least once before going there to get into the ocean. Um, and then it's a matter of preference, thinking about a subsurface mission. Uh, the kinds of technologies we think about don't actually have like open boreholes. So if you think about a normal hole that's drilled out, all of the material is excavated. Well, you can save a lot of energy first if you don't have to take that material out of the hole. Um, and for ice, you save a lot if you don't have to keep it liquid. So one way to think about these is they're self-contained probes that would melt through the ice um, and then the borehole would just freeze a couple meters behind them. And so you're only really bothering to keep ice melted on either side of the vehicle. So the concepts I work on are, um, you know, aiming to have feasible technologies for the late 2030s. Uh, not to say that, you know, it's <laughs> there's going to be a mission in the late 2030s, but that um, that's kind of the target we think about when we're developing these technologies. And so I think that as a follow-up to a Europa lander mission, uh, you could you could try for really deep potential ocean access. Um, I would push for that. Uh, Ed asks, how long for Clipper to get to Europa and how it's going to be launched? So one of the difficulties with the Europa Clipper mission right now are, is that... Uh, it's not really a difficulty. One aspect of the Europa Clipper mission is that it's a very large national mission. Uh, it's something called a flagship. It took an act of Congress to pass because it it really takes sort of a civilization scale effort to do a mission like Europa Clipper. Um, right now, one of the launch vehicles that we've been working towards is something called the Space Launch System or SLS. This is the same rocket uh, that um, NASA eventually wants to use to take Artemis astronauts to the moon, for example. That rocket is powerful enough that you simply point it at Jupiter, pull the trigger, and you're there in two years, two and a half years. Uh, so that's a very quick transit. There are alternatives, like if we were, you mentioned SpaceX, um, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy might be capable of launching Europa Clipper, but not on a trajectory that's straight to Jupiter. Um, you do something called gravity assist, where you uh, stay in the inner solar system for a while and you fly by planets like Venus and Earth, Mars, um, and you take just a little bit of the momentum with you each time you fly by. Uh, and so you build up speed and eventually you go out to the outer solar system. Um, a process like that takes a bit longer. Uh, and so really there's a, a kind of competition about when an SLS rocket might be available, what's the best way to get there, what's the fastest when you consider all these schedules. So it's a bit of a nuanced question, but um, the answer is that uh, it'll take somewhere between a couple and maybe six years to get there after it launches, and it could either launch on NASA's space launch system or potentially a commercial rocket. Um, so is there a lot of variable in the thickness of the ice at Europa? I would say a good part of my day job is trying to think about the ice shell thickness of Europa. We don't actually know what it is. Um, I think it's about 20 kilometers. Some folks think it's about three and some folks think it's you know 80 or 100. Uh, so one of the aspects of my job is to try and estimate um, what is the likely thickness of the ice shell? What do we actually know about that thickness? Uh, for, you know, the ice shell might be three or five kilometers thick. But because it also might be 40, it places a lot of constraints on how you can design and think about these technologies for the future. 
Um, so I'll leave you with the answer. I don't know if there's a lot of variable or variability in the thickness of the ice at Europa. Um, I think probably. Uh, Kelly, my high school junior is interested in astrobiology. Any suggestions for an undergraduate school or major? It's a really good question. Um, I consider myself a flavor of astrobiologist and I did an engineering bachelor's and then got a PhD in geology. So it was a bit of a circuitous path. I think um, if somebody was interested in being an astrobiologist, a couple of the things I would really recommend they study are um, chemistry, the different processes that make up a system. So it's not uh, identical to something like um, biology here, where you know what you're looking for, where you know how a bacteria works, and so you really investigate um, bacterial environments, but rather what do systems that life live in, uh, how do those work? What are the key aspects you're looking for? And so um, for uh, undergraduates, I, I think, um, you know, chemistry and biology can be really good fields. Uh, I know a lot of people with degrees in geology working on these kinds of problems, which might seem kind of at odds, but again, it helps you understand these bodies as a system. Um, there are people with backgrounds in physics. I, I know one person who did an entire career in uh, um, medicine with a pharmaceutical company before coming to be an astrobiologist. So I, I think really one of the keys uh, for anybody trying to do this work is to um, find degree programs just where you feel really engaged in the work. Because there are so many paths towards working on these problems. They're, they're, they're such large problems that there's really a lot of room at the table. Um, and the key is to find and capitalize on your interests uh, so that you can kind of, um, well, right. If you're interested in the problem, you're much more likely to pursue it. Uh, Kevin asks, what aspects of rocky surface interactions with oceans are most critical beyond the obvious? One of the biggest interactions between the surface and the ocean is a reaction that occurs between seawater and volcanic rock called serpentinization. It's called that because it turns the rock into a mineral called serpentinite. It's green, so serpentine. Um, serpents are green, I suppose. Uh, that reaction, the byproducts of it are what tends to reduce the ocean. And so that kind of supplies um, one of the two terminals for potential habitability where the other is supplied at the surface. And so that means that the rock has to have geologic activity that causes it to break or fracture, to expose fresh new rock to react with that ocean to keep the processes going. Um, and so thinking about the water interacting with the rocky surface, I think the most critical aspect are, are finding ways to constantly expose fresh new rock to keep those reactions going. From Tom, what areas do I personally think are the promising for future Norway-US collabor collaborations? Sure, I can talk about that and elaborating on some more of the current collaborations. I know that um, others I work with might be talking about some specific things in the future, but I, I, I think there are two really strong areas for collaborations on ocean worlds. Um, with Norway. One is in thinking about analog field experiments, like uh, access to ice is not as trivial as it seems. Um, somewhere like Svalbard that has a really good infrastructure and ability to get you out on ice is really important because again, while the surface of Europa and Earth are very different, the uh, deep interior of the ice, actually about seven kilometers deep on Europa is, um, pretty similar to about one kilometer deep in ice on Earth in both temperature and pressure. So field sites where we can go test some of this equipment in shallow ice like Svalbard or in deep ice like Antarctica, I think access to those is so in the science that we do there is a great place for collaboration. And the other is in the more astrobiological and oceanographic aspects of planetary research. Myself, uh, I said I got a PhD in geology, but I spent a lot of time on ships doing um, surveys of marine environments. And, you know, one of my fondest memories was uh, sailing out of Bergen on the RV Hakan Mosby. And um, there were, you know, a lot of different disciplines on those cruises and uh, a lot of different nationalities. And I think 
that becomes really important because of how difficult these problems are that uh, making sure you get a lot of intersection between different labs and backgrounds is really critical to uh, advancing the science. So Brandon asks, is there the possibility of landing a submersible on the surface of Titan uh, to study an extraterrestrial ocean? So I'll do one little qualifier. Uh, Titan's ice shell is probably like 150 kilometers thick. It's really, really difficult to get through. but uh, to get down to the water ocean of Titan. But the surface of Titan has methane lakes and cave systems, and who knows what habitable environments in those might look like. So there have actually been proposals in the past of what a Titan methane submersible might look like. Um, and I know there are a lot of folks still interested in proposing those concepts going forward. So uh, I, I think for Titan, it's much easier to access um, liquids on the surface than at depth. Uh, and the follow-up was, how long might it take for um, a Europa Osher goer to melt through the ice? Uh, right now, we think it would probably take somewhere between two and a half and six years. Um, from the time you're on the surface to the time you're in the ocean. It's slow going and arduous work. Um, and so you can imagine there's a lot of challenges associated with that. Uh, just keeping a vehicle operating for several years is difficult, especially when you're deep into an alien ice shell and you need to communicate back to the surface and then communicate that to Earth. Um, so it takes a considerable amount of time. And as I think about it right now, uh, you finally get to the ocean, but um, I, I wouldn't expect personally that a lot of your time is spent there, uh, especially because any picture you take in the ocean, you're going to have to transmit back up through, you know, tens of kilometers of ice and then transmit it back to Earth from Jupiter. And so it's really, really slow data rates. We're talking like uh, where you might have a 200 megabit per second connection at home. We're talking about 100 bits per second, so a million times slower. Um, and... You know, so I, I'm personally tempering my expectations for 4K 3D videos of space whales uh, from Ed. Given the enormous pressures for deep oceans like Europa, does it make sense to go to a world with an ocean not as deep? Um, that's actually something that uh, we talk about is, I, I don't think the answer or the question can be answered yes or no, other than yes, definitely for Earth. Um, there's a lot of different depths of water on Earth and a lot of different depths of ice. And so we need to make sure our technology works here first. But uh, in thinking about the order in which you'd go explore ocean worlds, I talked about Enceladus being smaller than the state of California. It's a tiny little baby ocean world, um, but it only has you know a tenth the gravity of even Europa. It's it's very very low gravity. It's smaller than some asteroids. And so you can imagine there's just not an enormous amount of pressure. No matter how far you go down in the water column, it's um, the equivalent of only going a couple kilometers through ice on Earth. And so if it turns out down the line that the thing really holding up this technology is our ability to withstand the pressure, it might make more sense to go somewhere like Enceladus first. Uh, Brandon says ComSat's around Jupiter. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. The issue is ComSat's around Jupiter. Or, um, a little bit expensive. So, but there are a, a lot of concepts that look at what a communications relay spacecraft would look like if you sent it along. In fact, um, early versions of uh, a pretty mature concept for Europa Lander now actually looked at bringing their own ComSat along to get rid of this um, challenge. But yeah, I, I, communications are certainly one of the largest challenges associated with a problem like this. Other than, as I'll point to again, the actual surface of an ocean world like Europa, which you can see on your screen, and how terrifying it looks uh, to land on it all. Okay. Um, well, Sam, that was an incredible talk, and it's always exciting to hear from you or hear about uh, what you talk about, even though we hear know you quite well, um, it's still always very exciting to hear new things and you always come with new discoveries and new angles, so very exciting. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to also ask you a question. How can people get involved? It was sort of uh, asked by earlier about how uh, one high school student could get involved, but how could people get involved with uh, Ocean Wells? Do you have any thoughts on that that you can share? Because, well, you said that it's important to have multidisciplinary teams. It's valuable to have people from different countries. Uh, we have, you know, we talked about Norway, but we have people now from Canada, Western Samoa, Argentina. So uh, listening to you, um, do you have any thoughts you want to share? Sure. I, I think one of the... Uh, well, I'll give a couple answers um, because there are different ways to be involved. If uh, you're a student thinking about how to get involved in these kind of projects, well, there's a, NASA has an education office that organizes um, a lot of different types of internships and programs. And so uh, is Ocean Worlds become a larger part of the portfolio within NASA, uh, you know, those programs are going to support connections to this work more and more. Moving up, if you're a college student or a graduate student and um, want to get involved, then uh, I would absolutely recommend just reaching out to people whose work you find interesting and uh, trying to figure out, you know, what an internship opportunity might look like. Every NASA center has undergraduate internships and graduate internships. and um, there's a pretty good job of, of matching people with the kind of work they want to do. There's all sorts of educational resources online and abilities for the public to interact through lectures and panels kind of like this. Um, for, you know, uh, potential collaborations between international partners or with research partners or uh, industry representatives abroad, I think um, these kinds of events you're hosting can be great for networking helping folks get in contact with each other. But uh, also in thinking about those broader collaborations, I, I think part of the difficulty is, right, getting in contact with the people who are involved. Um, that one I'm, I'm still <laughs> figuring out. Uh, it's, it seems a lot like there, it's easier to get students involved than more remote partners. Um, So with that, uh, I guess I'm a little short on the answer. Okay. No, but but if you have any grand advice, <laughs> or uh, top well, I, I see, uh, Sam, I can add in a few things there. Um, NCBA, we're working uh, with the par uh, universities in Norway to get uh, interns over to, uh, for example, JPL or the NASA centers. And uh, there are similar op opportunities in other countries as well, but we've had a few, quite a few actually. And uh, so it, you know, uh, it's, it's a matter of if you're interested in getting, there could be the embassy in your country, uh, in the US could be a, a, per, a, a way to get in touch. It could also be uh, some of these uh, business associations or chambers of commerce that are focusing on on uh, your particular country. So, for example, if there's a chamber of commerce or business association for Argentina or Canada, you know, in, in uh, Los Angeles, maybe that could be a, a good way to do it. And, and of course, um, we're working on developing collaboration through NCBA. It, yes, we're focusing on Norway, but if somebody has a question, we'd be more than happy to help them too. So, uh, I, I, I don't know, that, I think that helps you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, one answer occurs to me there. Um, knowing the folks I work with at yeah. NASA JPL and other NASA centers and universities, uh, I would say the number one way to get in contact with people if you're interested is to send them a cold email because I at least love getting them. <laughs> I'm sure many people do. Um, it never hurts to ask how to get involved in a project. Absolutely. Uh, I do want to make sure I answered Janine's last question of how do you know if the exploration technology isn't disrupting, annoying, or killing life forms in these oceans? It's a really good question. You can imagine if you live next door to a large percussive drill that has been pounding its way through the ice for six years, you might be pretty annoyed. Um, I don't have an answer. I don't have a great grasp of what the life in the oceans is like, and so it's hard to know if we're going to annoy them. Um, I guess that's the answer. 
I don't know if the exploration technology is annoying. I hope it's not killing the life forms. Uh, if there's a lot of like microbial life, they might not be terribly happy being ingested by a cryobot and run past a giant heater. <laughs> but um, yeah, the the question's pretty open-ended on what it's going to do for the life. I hope the life is there in the first place. If there is life too annoying on Europa, I'll see that as a positive outcome. Okay. Um, I, I think we're running the, uh, pretty much on time here. So I, I think it, if there are no more questions, actually there were a few, Mona. Uh, uh, okay, Tom added a comment, okay. Uh, put my application, yes. Okay, that was James. Yeah, we all know that. Um, okay, I think we don't need to make any comments on that. Do we, uh, or do you want to make comments on these last ones, Sam? Before we no, uh, only the internship programs and cold emails are the path I took and probably the path a lot of folks took. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll answer the last question that just came in. Could life exist on the bare surface of these planets outside the ocean? Uh, and as long as you're asking, can it exist? And instead of does it exist? The answer is probably not no. Uh, I certainly know that potential near surface habitable environments is a current area of active research. If it turns out you don't have to go to the ocean, life is a lot easier. Yep. Okay. Um, well, Sam, thank you again. I know if we had the people that had the ability to give you a big hand, they would, because this was really exciting. And um, what I'd like to also uh, add in here very last, and I think you all can see this, um, we, this is a series of Ocean Worlds talks. We, we're delighted to have you started. On January 14, we're going to have a talk about Prime. That is actually a, a probe, or we'll call it a submarine, that is going through the ice on Europa and uh, into the ocean. And that will be myself or Jean-Pierre Floreal, who is the PI. I was part of the uh, part of that project. And then on February 10, we're going to have a talk by Tom Nordheim on Brewery. He's worked a lot on that project. It's very exciting, and you heard Sam talk about it. Um, and, and this is, again, uh, us coming up with ideas and trying to work them out and doing everything that needs to be done from an engineering and science perspective to make it happen. And then March 10, one of my very good friends and also, Colin Carpenter, he's a genius engineer. Um, he's going to talk about eels. It's really a snake-like robot, or call it an eel, uh, that's going to explore crevasses and it will for even descending into the vents. I'm focusing here is on Enceladus, and we're already talking about uh, testing uh, it on Svalbard. And that also goes for the uh, uh, Prime, as uh, I, I suspect also Tom Brewey at some point, but we haven't discussed that too much yet. Um, so it's a, keep, uh, keep in touch with us. Uh, join us for the next ones. I hope this was a great experience. I really appreciate you all being part of it. And we're looking forward to seeing you next time. And uh, till, that, uh, till that time, stay safe and uh, keep in good spirits. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, Francis, Tom, did you want to say something before we close off? No, good. Great talk. Thank you. Tom? I guess not. Okay. With, with that, um, I actually, let me just see. Oh, I got a whole lot of new, uh, okay. I don't know if you see this, Sam, but, um, uh, I'm reading here. Awesome. Thanks. Great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, excellent. My pleasure. Sam. These are the hands that they cannot give us. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll send you a link and we'll send you a follow up and thank you for joining us for this event and we'll provide you links um, from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, well, we'll send everybody who signed up for this one links to the next one, and we'll send out that very soon. And that's going to be a phenomenal talk, too. Um, yeah, you don't want to miss that. The same goes for the February and March one. 
And in, uh, we're also going to have probably in April a talk by a gentleman, Jack Kohler, who is a geologist at the Norwegian Polar Institute. He's going to talk about the details of Svalbard that Sam mentioned today. It's an extraordinarily interesting site. And there's even a university up there. They won't believe it. It's, uh, it's uh, hard to believe, but it's true. <laughs> so with that, thank you, everybody. And looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much again, Sam. Totally awesome. And you see all the comments here. I can save them for you and uh, you can see them all. Thank you so much, everybody.